Thanks, Rachel. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. And um, this is our second, if only we could make better use of our building um, webinar. It's uh, great to see Sally with us again, who spoke to us last time about project management. Thanks, Sally, for being here to be able to answer any more questions or uh, lead us through um, some thoughts and, and um, questions this morning. And thank you as well for, to Kevin, who's going to come and talk about the project in, um, oh my goodness, help me to say it. Don't, don't help me to say it. Let me say it. Let me say it. Say it. And then you can all laugh at me. Kakaldi, Kakadi, Kakadi. Yeah. Yes. Here's Saffron. Yay. Praise God. <laughs> and we've also got Sue from Bonavon, who's also going to talk about the project that the huge project they've done there as well. Um, Kevin's huge project too. And I'm waiting for Eric, actually. Eric's not here yet. He's going to talk about Wood and Ferris and the project, the building that they've done there. So we've, um, we'll pray that Eric joins us this morning too. Okay, so last time we had a little... Um, morning, Saffron. Good to see you on your little screen. Morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good to see you. Okay. And then, um, so what we want to do to begin with then is just kind of have a little reflection, reflection on what happened last time. And then anybody that was here last time can feed back and just share a little bit of their thoughts and where they've gone and maybe what they've done since last time. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so last time, if you remember, Saffron went through um, some ideas of how you start a project and what you do. And I think this was the one kind of screen that we were really um, kicking by, wasn't it? That we were shown a plan, a layout of the building. And then we had these red spots um, of where, where people actually went. Um, map exactly where is used in an everyday running and maybe thinking about that on different days at different <clears throat> within the day so that you could really see from where the, where people use and how you can make better use of that space if you're thinking about doing um, a project. So um, that was the first thing that we could maybe talk about and discuss about how we've gone and whether any of us have done that since. Um, I also had some feedback from Hillary. She's not able to be here today because it is the North uh, West Midlands Area Assembly Day. But she has done some feedback and I just thought it was worth sharing with you. I just wanted to thank Saffron and Sally for their efforts. She found it an interesting meeting whilst um, Newcastle are not looking to knock anything down or do any major work at present. We're getting more and more inquiries regarding room hire and then therefore looking at better use of our space. So Saffron's four planner with the red dots to indicate the four valuable. I've already managed to identify a small room which is basically unused and by moving things around we now have some generous storage options and we're finding that more and more organisations will overuse the premises if they can store their stuff on premises and both some organisations have some stuff. <laughs> And uh, one's just arrived with a grand piano. So I thought that was quite interesting to, although there was no project work, still that red dot plan was something that um, the church found invaluable. Mm. Discussion around grants, and I'd just like to add that if anyone decides to apply for a lottery grant, many churches I know will not go down this route. But we did, and I spent almost three years getting all sorts of surveys, quinquennials, bat surveys, pricing many items, spy a survey, and so it goes on, filling in numerous forms to be successful. Think hard before processing. As with building work, better have a professional on board, but then again, it's quite a lot of outlay and the outcome is unknown. And then she also went on to say that being a, um, oh, sorry, everybody, I've gone wrong there, put the wrong thing. Being um, a listed building is certainly been a double-edged sword. Other than standard maintenance of the building, you cannot move or change anything without permission. So we're listed with English Heritage Grade 2, but cannot move pews, cannot alter anything. And if we have work done on the case of repointing our spire, we've had to use companies who have the right registration to work on listed buildings. And that's not always been the cheapest option. 
we only get a very small percentage paid by English heritage. And we have a local lady on the borough council who looks after the heritage of the town. And recently we asked to replace a shabby broken window. She came, she took pictures, she asked for the diagram on graph paper with measurements. We went away and then informed me that we needed permission from English heritage because of special glass required. And she was nervous mm. about saying yes. So it was very disappointing as we had the money from a legacy to do this, but currently no one with the capacity to go through the process. So um, it was, she was just feeding back from last time about some of the issues and some of the things that had happened. Um, so I thought that was quite helpful to share. And then I just wanted to share with you um, two things that have come into my inbox this week. The first thing is about National Churches Trust. Um, there's a grant inquiry session. So they give lots of grants and it's for funding regular maintenance, for urgent repairs, for project development and for facilities installation. Wednesday the 21st of July at 2.30. It's a free session and it's just um, talking a little bit about grants and, and how you'd go about applying and, and how you'd be successful. And hey, Yvonne, sorry, just before you go on, forgive me, yeah, can sorry. I just encourage people that to go on to the National Churches Trust website if you never have. Mm. It's, it's a fantastic site and they have oodles and oodles of examples you know, of churches of all denominations who've received grants for all kinds of stuff. You know, lots of photographs, lots of descriptions, lots of um, guidance documents. There's a, there's a real wealth of of of, um, uh, of of helpful sort of guidance and examples on that, as well as information about the actual grants that they give. So just to encourage people to really go on that. And then this session, I think, is helping people to go through that, Walter, which is which is great, and a lot of notice there as well nice time in the afternoon and then just as an update it came through my inbox again this week was just to say that um it's only for a very short time this is a, a government grant scheme for protective security so if you've had problems um with um theft or with vandalism then you can um, apply for this protective security scheme through the government and it's been extended till July the 16th and you can go on and just check that out. Um, so I just thought I'd share that with you. Yvonne, could you please uh, email that uh, slide through? I will, yes. yes. Thank you. I'll send that through to you. Okay. Now let's do some feedback then. So, um, Gillian and Sandra from Daily Bridge, have you got anything to share with us since last time that you took away or that you're able to action? No pressure if you haven't, was that possibly <laughs> fine, but um, you know, was there anything that you've thought about or that you, you're still planning to do or that you've done since the last session? Um, I think we're still in the thinking about it and planning stage. Yeah. I mean, ideally, I'd like to see our building used a lot more than on a Sunday morning, a Thursday for um, a group once a month and church meetings, but is persuading other people to let people come in and use our building for other things. Yeah. About you, Jill? Yeah, well, I belong to the hospice choir, I've just retired from working as a registered general nurse at the hospice. And um, we use the premises for our choir, but because of COVID, we've had to not have any practices, obviously, for the last 16 months. We've just started to meet outside uh, when the weather's fine, outside a Church of England church in Duckingfield. But they've asked if um, our church could be used because we do a concert usually every year at church and we donate the money to the hospice that's made. So starting should have been the 21st of June, but lockdown wasn't lifted. So hopefully when the lockdown is lifted in this month, July, we're going to meet in our church on a, a Tuesday evening for choir rehearsals. So that's one, the beginning of uh, better use of our buildings. Yeah, we'll see brilliant. how that goes. Well, that's good. And hopefully singing as well, Gillian. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll be singing. I mean, I'll be the one to open and lock up because it's, you know, I'm, of deacon and uh, I'm in the choir so yeah. that uh, we'll see how that goes whether we actually will return back to the hospice in time we'll yeah. see yeah. um because you know the hospice we're not charging the choir to use the building no. but it'll be good because it'll get people into uh, 
which they know about the church because we've had rehearsed, we've had our practices there before for we've done a concert but it okay. might get more people to come to church as well yeah okay great okay well well done good to be uh, thinking ahead um yeah well, i know you've taken um advantage of the grant so remember as well we've got grants available if you want to to move with a project you know we can help you a little bit financially with that what's happened since the last webinar and um, with you daryl anything to share or be encouraged by uh yes a couple of things is obviously two churches at um tapton we've always thought we were really good at being wheelchair and buggy friendly uh the church is virtually on a flat with ramps into the worship area uh, but what we found was that actually to get from the pavement to the church, there's a couple of lips. Uh, and with the new design of wheelchair with rotating wheels on the front, they went at 90 degrees and they just get jammed. So we did fine. We were we thought we were being really good, but actually we were rubbish. Uh, so um, what we've done is uh, we put a project in to... Uh, concrete between the pavement and the church to give a flat entrance. Um, at Hillsborough, it's really the ongoing thing of looking at uh, holes in the roof. But one encouraging thing is that I do find we've had a lot of inquiries. I think one thing that's happened with COVID is that a number of venues have either closed or they've not reopened or they don't want people back. And people, certainly in the Hillsborough area, are looking at new options. So we've had new inquiries. Uh, and one of Suzanne's last tasks is um, we've taken photos within the church and we're going to bang it on social media. Yeah, great. That's to get more people in. That's the same with Staley Bridge then, isn't it, Gillian? Just the opportunity to get more people in and different people wanting them. Um, to find somewhere to be able to gather. That's great news, Daryl. Um, thanks for sharing that. Now, I know, um, Sue, um, you weren't able to join us last time from Crediton, so welcome today. It's good to see you. And Sanya as well from Upper Calais. Um, was there anything particular that you wanted to, well, let's start with you, Sue. Was there anything particular you wanted to talk about or learn from this morning just for Sally and Saffron's, um, give them a head up? Uh, no, not really. It's just, I'm responsible for the lettings in our church, and um, I thought it'd be more about how this would be more about how we use the buildings we've got and not doing reordering projects. Um, okay. But we we have done reordering projects, and I just want to make sure that we're using now using it to the the best of our ability, really. <clears throat> so that's why I'm here. Okay, so Saffron might be able to talk a little bit more about that plan then that we looked at last time with the dots mm -hmm. on how you could do that. That that mm. we fed back on as well with with the lettings and the use of the building. Sonia, yeah. what about you? Um, well, in Upper Calais, we're looking to replace our vestry. We started a working group back in 2019, um, came up with a design to do the vestry and also a coffee shop, a proper um, barista coffee shop because wow. there's nothing where we are in Ethical Yeah. Our church is the last thing before you go out onto the Goa. Yeah. So we felt that there's an opportunity to bring our community in. <coughs> and during lockdown, we didn't do a great deal because you couldn't, but we did start to say, well, we, we were saving. And we have enough money now to get our project to planning stage and um, the building regs. We've had our second draft plans and we're happy with those. We've got an architect on board and our plans are ready to submit to our congregation in our AGM in July. And if we can get them to agree them, then we can go to the council for the pre-planning. Brilliant. That's great news. That's very exciting. Isn't it? Oh, it's exciting brilliant. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's things happening through COVID, which is lovely. You know, it's nice that there's something positive. Yeah, definitely. Um, brilliant. I'll look forward to keeping an eye on those plans and how they move forward. Yeah. 
Can you I listen to um, the podcast from the last time. Oh, okay, good. And something we haven't done, which is something we're going to have to do straight away, is to contact the trustees in Nottingham because we haven't told them what we're planning to do. Okay. So. All right, that's fine. That's okay. We'll give them, I'll give Mark the heads up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, David at Green Acres, um, since the last webinar, how have things moved? Uh, any thoughts? Any actions? No, we've not really made any actions. Uh, I, th I think Peter was with me last time. Uh, we both came expecting a different sort of webinar in, in, in the first one. Uh, okay. A bit like so. Uh, we were wanting ideas to make uh, better use uh, of the facilities we've already got uh, so the fact that it was talking about knocking down walls and building things and it wasn't quite what we were looking for so I, I'm hoping for maybe something a little bit different today uh, okay. I don't know but just I'm just picking up little bits of information but <clears throat> nothing really that from the first session that we've that okay. we've implemented, implemented. okay well, if, if we if we need to do some more follow up stuff, we we will do if we're still not um, hitting the nail on the head kind of thing. Okay, and Julia, is there anything you'd like to share? Any expectations? What what, what church are you from? Sorry, um, I'm from uh, London Road uh, Congregational Church in Newark. Newark. Um, yeah, my husband's um, been on several webinars with Walter, okay. um, but I haven't met him before. Um, I'm our eco church rep. Um, having been an environmental auditor in a previous job, we're just acquiring bronze at the moment. Um, we've got really? a large church with a very active church hall, um, but a tiny bit of grounds, um, no graveyard or anything like that. And it's about how we might be able to use the church better. Love the idea of the floor plan um, because we're quite new to our church. We've only, we've only become members this year. Um, and um, I and, and, and COVID's been here, so I haven't been, I've only been in the church for service twice. We have a choir um, where the hall is used by Mencap four days a week um, and has very good facility. We have good kitchen facilities, it has a stage. We're about to have um, our first free concert by um, a local um, folk group called Winter Wilson that are going around churches just because they need, they want to get back out and they're doing small, tiny venues, doing it free with donations nice. for charity. So I'm gonna watch how that works because we're into folk music. Hmm. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, I just want to see how the church might be able to be used better um, so that we can raise money to do some big projects for, for ecological purposes, like taking yeah. out the old heating system because we now use overhead. Okay. Um, heaters but the person that said about um, church and storage is very very valuable we lived in Northumberland and we had a tiny church that was a chapel of ease and had no storage and we took out the pews we did huge uh, change the um, vestry into a loom built a new vestry in the church doubled the size and totally renovated a kitchen Loads of people wanted to use the church, but an awful lot wanted storage space, and we just didn't have it because yeah. we had no loft. It was all open, everything, and that really prevented and made things, even like mother and toddlers, quite difficult. Yeah. So that's a very, very valuable one if you can find storage to attract to attract renters. Yeah. So that might be a heads up for you, Daryl, and for Jim as well. Yeah. I've written I've written it down because I haven't even done. There's an upstairs in the church, and I haven't even been up there yet. Uh, so, <laughs> um, to explore. And of course, you've forgotten the most important bit, Julie. You've got lovely new toilets in there. That was one of my first ever jobs <laughs> as general secretary is to cut the ribbon on your new toilet. Oh, right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, Adrian, you shared with us last time your um, the story of Stambourne, how you were going. Was there anything you wanted to update us with or share with us this time? Well, it's not moving very far, the project we were doing. Um, we're trying to raise some cash to uh, take the project yeah. forward. So yeah. it's all about money raising. But okay. what has happened since is the um, Essex County Council um, and our local Braintree District Council 
decided they wanted to come into the church and uh, run an event to get people back into them back into the community. Right. So we had the um, Ranger District in. Council, we had the fire service, the police, um, and various other charities came into the church and uh, and ran a morning session, um, oh. which should have been useful, but um, unfortunately they gave us a week's notice. <laughs> oh dear. Which really doesn't uh, give okay. people time to book it in. Right. Um, but it, I, it just, I just felt that that was a one way we can reach out into the community and to allow yes. these people to talk to their communities. Yeah. Uh, okay, different, brilliant. Different way of Thanks. doing things. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, Sally and Saffron, was there anything you want to just input at, that, at this stage before we go on to Saffron's presentation? No, I don't think so for me. Okay, thanks, Sally. Now, shall I, shall we, shall I share the screen then? Um, Saffron, you want to start your presentation for this morning? Yes. Okay. Um, I've emailed it to you. Yes, I have it. Yeah, it's halfway through. This from the beginning here? No, from about halfway through. Oh, okay. That was the last one. There we, there we go. There we go. Okay, just let me know then when you want me to move it along. Sure. Okay, so um, thinking about, um, so previously we looked at, you know, um, assessing what you have currently and thinking about if you actually do need to do building works or not. Actually, Yvonne, it might be useful to see the heat map for that church that I haven't yet seen it. Um, actually as well, um, Saffron, because we've got a couple of people that weren't here last time. Do you want to just introduce sure. yourself as well? I'm sorry, I should have. Uh, oh. should have... Sure, um, so I'm Saffron. I um, go to North Street Church in Taunton. I am a building surveyor and um, I've worked in construction for um, quite a few years. I can't remember how many. Um, <laughs> and I, I've, Yvonne asked me to sort of give a sort of building inspector's sort of view on things really for this. Um, so as part of my job, I deal with the planning and uh, building control and uh, those sort of aspects of construction works. Um, something that I use quite a bit um, when looking at existing buildings is, as you can see on the screen, it is a, uh, a, a plan of your building. So um, ideally to scale, but you can just sort of sketch it out um, anyway. And then um, as they've done on this plan, what they've done is they've dotted exactly where has been used in the building over a period of time. So it might be a day, a week or a month in your church, depending on um, sort of how it is set up and how it is used. Um, but the, the dots are showing where football is mainly used so this can indicate different areas that actually might be better reconfigured or used slightly differently for storage or um how it will work so if you look at the map the one that's labeled the dining room you can see is really not used very much um so if that was my property that i owned i would be looking at what could i do to that dining room to make it used uh, better, more efficiently, whilst still keeping the same layout. Um, it might only be a minor change you need. It might be, um, you know, a different opportunities to put different items in that room. But I would be just looking at um, where, where have we got that we don't use, that we don't realize that we don't use effectively. <laughs> Um, so that is um, that one and then the next slide over um, no there's one with a floor plan keep going that one 
there we go so this is my barn that I'm doing um, what I did was I drew out the floor plan and I cut out little bits of furniture sort of to scale to give an idea and then with this plan I gave it to every member of the family and friends and anyone who wanted to um, and asked them to redesign the layout how would you turn this space into a house so they can place bits of furniture where they see fit and then see if that actually you know if there are any good ideas that have come up that have not been thought about how the configurations work um you know and if you do it over a group you can see if there are any similarities as well um and this can actually you know it's a bit of reassurance as well that you're you're not just going for the straightforward option that it is the best option and within our church meetings um it's actually really useful to get different people's perspective on it and their ideas because you can lay all of the plans that have been created out and then sort of have a round table discussion looking at them all looking at the pros and cons for each layout tweaking and amending them and seeing if you have come up with your ideal layout that could be that could be for the building works what are we going to use each room for or it could just be simple layouts and you look at say your chairs and you think right we've got to get two meter distance between these people how are we going to do that um you know as a sort of last year practicality terms it can be really quite useful to see it visually and say okay so we can get five rows in or for example without actually having to go and uh move them by hand to measure them <laughs> um, so that's what we were looking at last time so um going through um, basically it was just assessing if we need to carry out any works or if we can reuse exactly what we already have so if we've got to the stage where we're thinking actually we do need to do the works um, this is sort of that point in time so if you carry on Yvonne please so this the drawings and specifications now by doing your floor plans and having a really good idea um, you can go to a architect or a surveyor that's going to be doing this work for you with a really good idea as to exactly what you want to achieve exactly how you think you're going to achieve it and this will it will cost less because you've done most of the thinking for them you're literally just asking them to draw it up um, you have already thought about exactly how you want it laid out and the more that you can do yourself um, sort of the easier it is because you know uh, that your church will agree it and also it costs less money so before approaching someone to produce your drawings um, like I say you need a really good idea as to what you want to achieve if it's a long-term plan or a temporary fix your budget what sort of ballpark are you thinking because there might be different phases that you need to do um, for your budget or you could sort of limit or expand on the works as required and an idea of what you want to achieve so as I said the more the more that you can do at this stage before you employ anyone the better okay if you go on to the next one as well as well as um getting the permissions and the um, local authorities sign off there's actually quite a lot to do as said previously with relationships building mm -hmm. relationships getting people on board with what you are doing getting them understanding the purpose and um, sort of your vision and then the more that you can get people on board with you the less sort of resistance you will receive okay um so that's that's the council representatives um the local parish council can sometimes have quite an impact on if they approve or deny 
um, applications, they do ask for their comment when you get to the planning stage. Your neighbours, you don't want to particularly annoy your neighbours, uh, so it's good to have their input as well. Um, and then also as part of this relationship building, you can talk to different people and ask who they used for their works and get any recommendations um, as to exactly, you know, who to avoid as well as who to use. Uh, but the relationships are key to build and maintain throughout the process. So if we'll carry on. So for your approvals, there are two, um, the two main approvals to receive, and that is planning permission and building control approval. So um, I've written down the reasons why you might need the approvals for each type of project. You might need um, planning permission, but not building control. Um, and that does happen um, depending on what you're doing. Okay. To carry on. Sorry, um, Asafa, I was That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so your planning permission deals primarily with what you're going to do. Um, in very broad terms, it's what you're going to do. What is it going to look like? What uh, difference will it make? Um, th they're sort of looking at the overall view of the project and what it is. Okay, um, so on the right hand side, I've got a little flow chart showing you the different stages of obtaining planning permission. Um, and this can be quite useful to, to see sort of visually the steps that you go through. Um, I know personally that getting site visits, so having people having the planners or building control or whoever it is actually out to see in person for themselves the project is really beneficial because they can um, see in reality how it would look because sometimes on drawings although they use the drawings every day themselves uh, they can get a bit um, sort of diluted as to what they think is happening at the property. Um, so I would definitely recommend site visits and multiple applications for the same project are common. You might be going through this cycle a couple of times. That is absolutely normal um, and a bit of encouragement for you that if they don't say yes the first time, that's not necessarily a, uh, a no for the entire project. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah. The building control approval is a bit more complex um, in a sense of it deals with how you're going to do your project. Um, it, it goes more into detail as to the exact elements that you're using, how it's going to be constructed, how they all relate to each other, and um, Sort of how the how it will function okay and um, there are the building regulations which are online they're free to see there are a lot of them I wouldn't recommend sort of necessarily sitting there reading them because you'll be a little bit bogged down by them but your building control approval deals with how is your project meeting those building regulations. Um, also, it is likely that structural calculations will be required in this section when you submit for your building control approval. So if we want to go on. Structural calculations. So um, let me tell you a little bit about my my uh, barn at the moment, um, just as a as a point. Um, so I had structural calculations carried out 
um, by a qualified engineer. However, they didn't know particularly about the materials that I've got in my barn because it is a cob barn, so it's quite specialised. So I've just had out a engineer that specialises in cob to look at it. Um, it is important to get the experts in for this point uh, because they will tell you exactly how you're going to do any repairs, how uh, any works will be carried out and give you the detailed specification when it comes to your building works. Um, so it has to be sort of a, a qualified engineer, ideally that specialises or that knows a great deal about the exact material that you're do you're using and um, exactly what you want to achieve. So we'll move on. Um, then we get to choosing a, a, a contractor. So it might be that it's a DIY project uh, that you're doing and actually you don't need planning and you don't need building control and you can go straight to looking for a a builder or maybe somebody in the church that can do it themselves um, but this is sort of looking at the more complex side of things um, when it's a little bit more out of our remit as it were um, so recommendations are key uh, make sure they see exactly what you're wanting to do and achieve because they are the ones that will be turning it into a reality so to have them on board is key to see exactly, you know, what you're wanting to achieve for this and make sure you're on the same page. Um, do obtain a detailed breakdown of the costs for the work. Have it itemised exactly what are they going to do, where and how much will that cost. That should hopefully reduce some of the unknown costs that may appear having a detailed breakdown. Um, ideally, sort of fixed price contracts is they will complete all of the work for that fixed price and there are no surprises along the way. Um, sometimes this uh, is possible and other times it's not. Um, but if you can arrange that with whoever you're choosing, all the better. Okay, we want to look at the next one. So looking at the management of your project, have a think about who is going to actually manage it. Would you like a church member to manage the works? Um, as Sally was saying uh, last time, she very competently managed her own works. It is possible. You can do that. Or you can also employ a project manager to, um, to do that on your behalf. Um, who, who is the key contact? How involved are they going to be? Um, and also, importantly for us, what is the decision-making process um, going to be? Are you going to have a... Is it going to be a whole church discussion over what um, different elements will be? Potentially, that is the case uh, for the different stages. It might go to the whole church, or it might go to a group of people that have said actually we can take on the management of this as a small group or it might be down to individual uh, people to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis um, but have a good idea as to how decisions will be made so that when they arise which they will uh, you'll know how and have agreed how exactly you're going to deal with them um, and ideally your your project manager um, or the church member will be good with spreadsheets and good at communicating with the different um, people that are involved in your project. So that is a bit of a whirlwind through that uh, through that stage to get you from we've got our idea on what we want through to we know who's going to carry out the works exactly how and we've got all our permissions that are required. 
I was going to say, Stefan, you just put everyone off saying about spreadsheets. Don't think Sally knows <laughs> spreadsheets at all. <laughs> Project management, did you, Sally? <laughs> that was brilliant. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just so that you can keep an eye on exactly what stage is your project at. Have any costs come up that haven't been accounted for? Um, yeah. You know, just checking them yeah. off one by one. It doesn't have to be a complex spreadsheet you can have it as simple as you need it um, uh, it's just to really track it for you <laughs> absolutely I, sorry I actually think it's key because we had a government grant to do the works we did and we had to submit their paperwork time and time again and we needed the figures and doing our own spreadsheet was the yeah. only way of tracking it also yeah. helped when the builders' costs came in because they had missed off um, price. They'd missed off supplying and pricing one of the key things that we'd asked for. So it's a valuable checklist. It doesn't. It works as well as minding your costs. Saying, hang on a minute, they completely missed off the disabled, the baby change thing that we wanted, even though they'd seen it in our specification. You know, they they yeah. not spe missed it in yeah. the specification. So it 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 helps you as well. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and let's be honest, we can't all think of everything at once. Uh, so having it written down so that you can refer back to it, make sure it's there, um, is really invaluable. Thank you, Saffron. Much appreciated. Sally, was there anything you wanted to uh, input in there at all before we open it for questions? Uh, I don't think so. No. Oh, thank you. Okay, any questions for Saffron then at all about her presentation, planning permissions and gaining advice from specialists and um, keeping the communication with, um, keeping everyone updated about what's happening, making sure people are aware of what's going on. Was there any questions at all specifically for Saffron this morning? Are you able to send us a copy of that presentation, please? I'm sure, I, is that okay, Saffron? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'll send that to you. I'll send both of them to all of you afterwards. There we are. Thank you. Saffron, I've got a question for you. We were talking sure. about planning permissions, and you said that multiple applications might be needed. There's a cost, isn't there, per application? Sorry. Or said that there would have to be multiple applications sometimes for um, a project with the planners right sometimes so, yes yeah so each time you apply you, you're giving them another fee aren't you it's not just one fee for things coming back and forth yes you are um if if you have to make changes to the application then yes you are um, so it is a good idea to get to that point with all of the information possible that yeah. you have got. So that there's less backwards and forwardsing. Um, there's also a thing that you can do, which is your pre-planning um, visit. Um, so it's before you pay the full fee. It's sort of a mini inspection. You do pay for it, yeah. but it includes a site visit out discuss right. the project check exactly what details they may or may not require um i know that for you know for one of mine it was we want the walls uh recessed back on one of the projects yeah um, which yeah. is all well and good in an email but by how much would be the question um <laughs> so having them out uh we discussed it would be just 10 centimeters back and then when that was then amended on the plan and submitted, then that got approved. Um, so you can do your pre-planning, which is more of an informal chat before you submit for your full plans. Our architect actually told us that we didn't need to pay for our planning permission um, because we're a charity and because it was for disabled work. Um, so there was there were no costs involved in the planning permission process itself. Yes, there are different costs um, depending on exactly what it is and the scale of it as well. 
So is that is that a general thing, Saffron, or would we would need to investigate that a little bit further, that if it was a charity, you wouldn't have to pay that? Or is that just because it was specifically for disabled um, facilities, do you think? I, I haven't done much to do with um, sort of the charity side of things when it comes to planning. Um, mm-hmm. It would be also good to contact your council uh your local authority as well and just say this is what i'm planning to do what is your advice they love it when you ask for their input um and they become a much more receptive when you say oh well i spoke to whatever whoever person it is and what they suggested was um it shows that actually you're you're seeking their advice rather than just plowing ahead with what you want effectively um so yes it would be worth asking them we went to our local planning people and said um what we plan to do and they said put in planning permission for everything that you could possibly want um so we were talking about all sorts of different things um and do that all at one time so you would only pay one cost when we went to the architect, he said, um, actually, for charities and um, uh, people doing disabled uh, facilities, um, there is no cost for planning. Um, so we, it was our architect who actually told us and actually got agreement that um, there, there was no cost. The planning people wouldn't tell us that. <laughs> That's no. interesting, isn't it? Well, I think we'll find that out uh, for sure, whether that's across the board, Adrian, just uh, mm, as a yeah. follow up. That's um, thank you for sharing that. But, you know, then there's no, no worries. Then if he is going backwards and forwards, you know, the bill's not going up and up and up. I do think uh, one of the key points there was get a fixed price if possible. Uh, I hear of a number of people who've had estimates and they consider an estimate as being an actual fixed price. The job starts and the cost goes northwards and they've not got a leg to stand on. So I do think that is something worth, especially at the end of the day, a lot of churches are not building experts. They don't really know what, and they get a builder going along and saying, right, here you go, the we'll give you an estimate of this. And in people's genuine naivety, they just look, think, oh, the price is, is that. Once the work starts, something gets added, something gets added, and it just goes, it goes northwards. One of the problems I think at the moment is that builders are very busy. Um, so they're quoting long lead times. And also the cost of building materials is going up and up and up. Uh, so I think there's a bit of a reticence to give a fixed price, but certainly I think that's the best bit of advice uh, that Saffron has given today to people is just try and pin, pin a builder down. Um, usually they might put two or three months on the quote, but just get it so that is, that is what you're going to pay. Uh, and you're not suddenly hit with a far bigger bill, which then causes all kinds of problems. Uh, and I think the other thing, Yvonne, is um, I know Saffron said about one person or having a project manager involve the church would be my advice because you know what, if people are not informed and don't know what's going on, a lot of people suddenly evolve a lot of very good hindsight uh, and do come back to a church and go, well, you said this, you said this, this should have happened. The poor people that are trying to do the project get a bit agitated because people are suddenly leaping off the fence uh, with hindsight. So my advice is anything, just keep yeah. people informed, keep them involved. And say, if you've got anything to say, say it now. Yeah. Or forever hold your peace because... Uh, Otherwise, it can cause uh, problems. Good advice, Daryl. David? Uh, Sean and my wife, and I, I've, I've been watching, and we're very, very interested in the programme, or the series of programmes, George Clark's 
uh, building a new life. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Yeah. But it's basically where people uh, want to, generally, they want to move out of an urban area into the countryside and they take on a big, massive project, uh, renovating a barn, for example, or, or some you know, old cottage in a remote place. I think if you were to watch that, it will be a very valuable learning tool because everything we've been discussing about project man management and contractors and builders and escalating costs, the length of time it takes, if it's not properly managed, um, it just goes haywire. And very often, if you watch the programme, the, the people who are going into this have got absolutely no experience mm -hmm. and go on and take a huge big project on. And it costs them tens of thousands of pounds more or they fail or it, it takes a year longer. You know, it causes all sorts of stress. So I'm just saying as a learning tool, it might be an option to, to watch that if you're considering doing any kind of uh, work in the church building. It's not exactly the same, but you'll get a, an idea of, of the things that can go wrong very easily. Like Sally shared with us last time, didn't you, Sally? <laughs> okay, Julie. Can I ask, sorry, can I oh, ask yeah. a question if you don't mind? Yeah, um, I think Julia, do you want to ask as well? It's fine, because oh, mine's, yeah. mine's historical. Sonia's okay. got an active project, so please, Sonia. Go on, Sonia. Um, sorry, um, you mentioned about fixed price contracts. Should there be anything specified about completion dates? And if they go over, what happens? So you can get it uh, written into the contract with them a completion date. Yeah. Um, and you can also get it written in that there will be certain penalties if they were to go over that completion date. Yeah. Um, so you can get that written into your into the contract um it would it would then be sort of for the contractor themselves to agree if they are you know happy with those clauses in there um and getting them to agree to it as well right uh, but if you have a you know a definitive time schedule for it for it to have been completed by it is an option right thank you um how happy would contractors be is this something they're used to having written in or would most of them shy away from that um i think that also depends on the size of the building company and um what projects they've been working on previously <clears throat> For larger projects, it is a um, quite common to have a um, sort of time clause, as it were. Um, for smaller projects or, or smaller builders that um, might not uh, do the large projects, they're not as used to having those penalties on them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they might shy away and say, actually, that's, uh, you know, if you've only got, say, you know, one or two bricklayers that work for you or whatever, they say, actually, that's too much of a risk potentially for mm -hmm. us um, because there are lots of vari variables there um, that they might then shy away from it. Okay, thank you. When we're going to take a break now, but when we come back, Kevin and Sue are going to share about their building projects. So they might be able to be uh, some more, more insightful um, sh uh, sharing about finishing dates and, <laughs> and planning permissions and things like that. I'm relying on you, Kevin and Sue. <laughs> so we'll take a Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Saffron, for your input and for sharing. Uh, it's it's 11 o'clock now we're just going to take five minutes comfort break uh, stretch your legs and um, make a cuppa uh, and then we'll be straight in to hear from Kevin and then Sue about their projects and um, what's happened in their church transformation amazing transformations that's happened in their churches thanks everybody five minutes please
Thanks, Yvonne. I'm sorry, I don't don't know you because we've not been members of London Road Congregational very long. So um, uh, I, I don't I, I don't even know your name. I'm not on the deacons or, or anything like that. So um, oh, no problem. It's good to meet you, Jenny. You're very welcome. <laughs> I just came in, let's say, because I've got an environmental background from my job. I work for a development company yeah. that I was able to say I would take this on. So um, uh -huh. I'm kind of thinking fast and what can we do and let's get this and let's do that. And then, but I don't know the history of an awful lot of it. So um, but, how's, how's the eco, um, how have you found the eco application? Uh, easy, easy to yeah. get. I, I did find... I did manage to find something that said it's 25% for bronze, 50 for silver and 75 for gold. Okay. So um, basically you tick the boxes and see where it, because there's five different sections. Mm. But then what you can do is carry on ticking, tick what you've got and then carry on ticking things that maybe are low cost yes. and see what little it takes just to get bronze in each section Yes. which is what I did. I did some jiggling and said, well, seriously, we only need to change a light bulb to a, a, a low energy here, or yeah. I only we need to put a couple of bird boxes up on the church. And yeah. that was it. We'd got bronze. Yeah, really Silver cool. now is to do the same and say, right, this is what we need to do. Take this to the deacons and say, what would you like me to get Happy. some costumes yeah. on? But it could be something huge, like taking out the old heating system because there's got to be leaks where all these old funnels go into the windows and right. a potential yeah. area that's dangerous underground. Yes. But yeah. we would likely to get grants for that, or it could be again, yeah. simple stuff. Yeah. So, um, but it, it yeah. is easy to navigate your way around. Oh, that's possibly. good, that's good to hear. Well, there's a this church down in the Southwest Midlands, Cheltenham. I know they've, they're working steadily through it. Mm. So if you ever want me to put you in contact with someone there that's kind of worked through it, then let me know. And there's yes. a church as well, actually, in the Southwest Midlands. That I've done a couple of the, um, I've done a couple of webinars. Oh, have you? With, through the Eco Church. With Eco and they're Eco. also, yeah. they're also, uh, they've told me they're quite willing to come and do a talk at our church to invite churches together. Oh, fantastic. To across. So great. I might try and arrange that for later yeah. this year. Oh, let me know. I'd be good. I'd be, um, I'd be interested to join in with that. Thank you. Lovely. Okay. I'm yeah. going to let you take your break. <laughs> oh, no, it's all right. Don't worry. Thanks, Saffron, for your input this morning. You're all right. Where are you? <laughs> um, I am in a, well, I'm on a farm in the middle of Dorset um, at a festival. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Oh, lucky, uh, lucky you! I was postponed. Oh, I was I was told reliably that their Wi-Fi, um, well, the Wi-Fi that I'm using, the router is on top of the chicken coop, which I'm sat next to. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. As I was just having a bit of issues connecting into it because it's a bit rural. Uh, yeah. well, um, well, we prayed before you, just before you arrived, that it would all be smooth. So uh, we, we thank God that it has worked and you were able to come in and the uh, it went fine, didn't it? The presentation. Yeah. We could all hear you and everything. So What's your festival, oh, okay. Saffron? Um, it's called uh, Trip to Verwood. Um, so my friend who, um, it's a folk festival, effectively. Right. My friend uh, owns a lot of the marquees and sound systems and stuff that get rented out to a lot of festivals. Right. Um, so we're just on their farm, effectively using their marquees because nobody's. So you're, so you're just outside Ringwood, aren't you? Verwood's just outside Ringwood. Yes. Yeah. So I'm from Southampton, yeah. so I know the area. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lovely, yeah, so, lovely part of the country. Yes. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, musicians that should have been at festivals that aren't because they're all cancelled, yeah. um, all here together, playing music, oh, singing lovely. songs, and just, it's just so nice to sort of, like, decompress yeah. from the last year or so. Yes, because Cropperty's, um, just, Cropperty's just been postponed. Just been cancelled, yeah. yeah, and uh, Warwick has as well, I no, yeah, I think Warwick has, yeah, um, so... You said that you're into your folk music. Um, who have we got here that you would know? Um, do you know a band called Granny's Attic? Yes. 
Yeah, they're here. Seen them at Shrewsbury, yeah. Yeah, um, Banter, the Kaylee Band. No, but love Kaylee music. No, yeah. they're here. Uh-huh. Um, Have you heard of Winter Wilson? Yeah, yeah. They well, they're coming yeah. to our church free on the 10th of July for an afternoon. Amazing. They're coming so and good. doing churches in, in afternoons just to get back to the public. Yeah. So really looking forward to that because they're, they're local. They're Grantham, I think, based. Right. Cool. Yeah. Will you this, take this doesn't pic- have... Oh, sorry. sorry. I was going to say, can you take a few pictures and do a paragraph about Winter Wilson coming to the church, Julia? That's so much... That's so uh, such so gracious, isn't it? That they're doing everything. Mm. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I'll get more details from Mark and Deb and, and yeah, find brilliant. out. Thank and, you. And just, yeah. Okay, I think we're all nearly back. Here's Sandra, and we'll uh, just give Deborah a minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Kevin, I'm delighted, and Sue, that you're able to share with us because you've both been through some. Um, I'm going through. I don't think you're quite finished. Are you both quite finished? Are you quite finished, Kevin? Nearly. I'll leave you to um, share anyway. Um, the transformations that uh, have happened to churches, just to inspire you and encourage you this morning. Um, on the front of the picture, these were Kevin's pictures. These were these were from um, Kevin's church. So, um, Kevin, I'm going to hand over to you now, and thank you okay. for being here this morning and for sharing your story with us. I'll try to share my screen with you. Um, right. Are folks able to see that? Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Uh, yes, right. So from Kirkcaldy Congregational Church, your um, pronunciation was pretty good, Yvonne. So well Thank done. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I did practice. Uh, <laughs> Walter is, I believe, from our, our neighbouring large town, uh, our, our, our little our little city neighbour to the to the west. Is that right, Walter, from Dunfermline? No one else may know the impudence of that remark. Yes, of course. But, but I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, well, having listened to, to a lot, and, and I did uh, sort of check in on your your, uh, your last webinar as well. Yesterday I had a, a listen through that as well, so that was all very helpful. And all the, the information about uh, sort of planning and consent and, and all of those things, uh, it all seems like a distant memory now. Uh, but the good news is we actually got our uh, sort of completion certificate through from the local authority just yesterday. So we're now actually uh, sort of ready to uh, work towards opening up again in the next sort of two or three weeks. So uh, wonderful. So that, that, that's good news. Uh, we're, we're pleased about that. Uh, but just to take you, I suppose, right back to the start. Um, uh, I'm reminded of uh, the, the old quip, uh, sort of, you know, when, when couples get married, you know, two become one, and after the after the service, you discover which one. Mm-hmm. Um, well, ours were two churches, um, one very small and one just a little bit bigger, but not too big, uh, in Kirkcaldy, um, had coexisted, uh, perhaps uh, more or less tolerated each other for many years, uh, very, various times over the last 150 years, worked well together for periods, and then basically ignored each other for periods. Uh, But I ended up, uh, to cut a long story short, as pastor of the the two churches um, on the condition uh, that that we would begin to to look to the future and uh, try and work out what direction of travel uh, we were going to take. Um, It became clear fairly early on that uh, neither church had a long uh, future if we simply just stuck to our own uh, little thing, doing our own little thing. And I suppose after about a year of becoming a joint pastorate, uh, I raised the, 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 the issue of uh, union. Uh, and it was almost like a, you know, somebody had uh, sort of opened the door and let uh, air into the place. It, the, the discussion was great. Uh, and we moved, not quickly, but uh, quite sort of methodically and very openly towards uh, a, a single uh, church. And the two became one. Uh, but which one, in a sense, was the question? We went through a whole process of sharing, uh, 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 developing a shared vision. Where are we? What do we want to be? We looked at our resources. We had a quinquennial surveys done of both buildings, strengths and weaknesses, fabric, condition, finance, costs of repair and upgrade and and all of those things. And the direction of travel we felt was important. We needed to know where we were going. 
uh, but we weren't so concerned about the, the speed of, of travel. Um, neither church was in a position where we, we desperately needed to unite because one was on the brink of collapse or closure. And we felt that that was important, that we could do things uh, without that, that pressure on us. And that's why we took that deliberate decision to, to preempt any sort of crisis. And we were able to work towards uh, a very happy uh, union of the two churches. Uh, and then we eventually did agree uh, which of the buildings we would keep. Um, it wasn't an easy decision, obviously, for the church uh, members who were going to lose their building, but it was handled sensitively. It was a very moving time, uh, great maturity in both congregations, uh, and uh, it was a real privilege to be part of that. Um, we opted for the town centre building. We felt that that's where our ministry could begin to expand and extend. There's a, a range of needs and opportunities uh, amongst homeless people, a lot of social isolation. Uh, Kirkcaldy is not a massive town, but 50,000 of a population. But uh, the other church was away up in the corner of the town, which was already well served for lots of churches. Um, but the town centre was quite sparsely served. There was only three denominations, including ourselves, represented in the town centre. And we're the only church on the town's high street. So we felt there was a presence needed. Uh, and that, that was one of the, the, the driving uh, sort of factors. And it was a larger building, potentially more useful, more flexible, and offered more opportunities. So uh, I, I suppose I inherited uh, what was then the West End Congregational Church building, uh, which looked fine. It looked a lovely building, but uh, there were tons of pigeon guano in the, the roof space. Uh, there were holes in the roof and the water was beginning to pour in and the building was frankly a, a bit of a mess. Um, we wondered whether we should keep either of the buildings at one point, uh, but we opted to, to keep one, uh, the town centre one, mainly because we were partly forced to do it. We have a 100-foot uh, steeple. Uh, we're right on the, the high street and there were problems that needed to be dealt with. So whether we had the building in use or not, as trustees, we still had a, a, an obligation, including a moral obligation, to make sure the building was safe. Uh, and we spent about £40,000 uh, just making the steeple uh, safe and secure. And that, in a sense, almost forced us to, to make that commitment to, to this particular building. It's a B-listed building. The, the listing uh, sort of uh, categories in that are slightly different. Uh, that would be a, probably a Category 2 uh, equivalent listed building uh, in an English sort of context. Um, one of the things we discovered early on with a, a couple of solicitors in the church who uh, have worked on these sorts of projects in the past, and we knew from a, an early stage that we would require a, a conservation accredited uh, architect if we were going to do any work on the building at all. We managed to sell uh, the other building very quickly, uh, so we had uh, those assets available to us. Um, we looked at uh, sort of finance and grants and uh, the budgets and so forth, and we had a very clear idea of what we could afford and what we really needed to do. Things like access were vitally important. Uh, there was no level access throughout the ground floor of the building. Um, and there were various other um, you know, issues that needed to be addressed. The place had uh, bits of wiring that were over 70 years old. Uh, I think it came uh, either with Noah or uh, sort of Fred Flintstone, I'm not quite sure, but it was about that sort of era. <laughs> so there were some real problems that we had to uh, deal with. The issue of engagement, well, we involve people, that's what we do, we are congregationalists, but it was involving folks beyond the church meeting as well. That was really, really important. Uh, we had some groups who used the building regularly, others who used the building sort of as a last resort because the facilities were really, really poor. And we had lots of discussions. Uh, we did a questionnaire. Uh, that we got folks to fill in. We asked them to be as blunt and direct as they possibly could be, uh, which they were, which we were grateful for. We, we listened and we absorbed, but we also uh, challenged and stretched people. It wasn't just a case of saying, oh yes, that sounds like a good idea. It was a case of challenging ideas so that we could begin to really uh, sort of hone in on, on what was essential, uh, what was perhaps ideal and what was perhaps, you know, a sort of cloud cuckoo land and would be great in a, in a perfect world, but probably not realisable at this particular uh, sort of point in time. Um, we 
also asked the architect uh, to, well, we'd engaged an architect uh, through a, a tendering process. I, I've been involved in sort of commissioning and uh, sort of um, managing projects for uh, local authorities and the NHS in the past. So i had done a bit of that. So we, we did a, a tendering process, which was actually quite good because each of the architects, uh, I think there were about three of them who, who put in a bid for it, they gave their ideas. So then we were able to steal the ideas of the ones who who weren't successful after as well. A bit cheeky, but well, there we go. That's 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 the way it goes. Um, but we asked for, for options and we were very keen to ensure that all of those options were put to folks. There was lots of time for discussion and feedback, but barring one decision, and that was the decision about removing the pews, every decision was unanimous right through the whole process. In fact, from the beginning of talking about union of the churches way, way back, Every decision has been unanimous right through initially in the two church meetings and uh, laterally in the, the single church meeting. Um, as I say, we had offloaded one of the buildings very, very quickly, much more quickly than we'd imagined. Uh, we looked at grant applications and we probably amassed about 60 to 70 thousand pounds in grants. Um, there was an opportunity for the congregation to give and to donate and some have given very, very generously. Um, but the, the big game changer for us was the, the arrival of a, a massive bequest way beyond anything that we, we could have anticipated. We, we had about £200,000 available to us um, and this took us from 200000 to uh, over £600,000 available to us, which utterly changed the landscape and actually presented us with another problem. Uh, because the problem then was we could have afforded anything we wanted uh, you know, within our sort of grand uh, cloud cuckoo land scheme of things. But we really had to ask ourselves, is this really necessary? You know, is it right? Uh, should we just be spending money because we've got it to spend? And we were very, believe, I believe, very careful uh, in terms of how we, how we use that money. Uh, we haven't gone wild, we haven't gone mad, but we have been able to do things that uh, we wouldn't have been able to do uh, otherwise. Um, as I say, we did a, a survey and questionnaire and things like that. Um, we were able to sort of pull together a, a sort of development plan, a consultation report. It's trying to be as professional as we possibly can be in terms of how you present yourself to, to funders and planners and, and all sorts. And um, I can make that available if anybody uh, was interested in it. Um, but then we had all the money together. We had our plans uh, all set out and whatever else. And that's where the fun begins, because it certainly gets worse before it gets better. Uh, because um, demolition started um, in February last year. Uh, I was interested in the, the sort of time uh, sort of scales being placed on projects and all the rest. We should have been finished in September last year. Uh, we're now finished in July this year. Uh, COVID was a mixed blessing. Uh, in some senses, there was no better year for the work to take place because for probably at least half of the last 15 months, the building would have been closed anyway. Uh, but the downside of it was that they couldn't bring their full sort of, uh, sort of team of workers in. So things were going to take much longer because they had to work in small groups and had to work uh, much more methodically rather than, I don't know, electricians and plumbers and all sorts of being in at the same time. Uh, they had to sort of work things in a much more uh, sort of tailored sort of way. And that took a, a, a longer a longer time. It was a fixed cost uh, project, but we were aware uh, that there were going to be potentially some major uh, additional items uh, sort of creeping in uh, to the process, and, and that proved to be the case as well. Um, so anyway, the, as I said, it gets worse before it gets better. Uh, bags of rubble, uh, removal of um, a, a long platform across the, the, the width of the, the church uh, that had been put up in the 1960s, which revealed, as I've guessed, uh, what had been there before. And in actual fact, we've gone back to the, the sort of platform area that we had uh, probably in the 1950s, uh, sort of 60s. Um, and lots of sort of funny stories about how things appeared out of people's garages. There were sort of pillars with knobbly bits on the top uh, that somebody had uh, reclaimed about 50 years ago and it had been lying in their garage. Mm. Uh, and that became available to us to be put back almost exactly where it had come from 50 years ago when the place was uh, gutted and uh, renovated in the, the late 60s. Uh, so really interesting little stories like that um, that, that, that sort of crop up. Mm. Um, but it, it, 
there was a major structural uh, sort of bit of work to be done. We were taking away uh, doorways, uh, taking away pillars under the gallery, uh, had to get all that sort of structural stuff done. And again, what Safran had said about ensuring that you had uh, sort of qualified engineers, that was all done through the architect. Uh, we, we chose that the architect would project manage uh, the thing for us, even though we probably could have done it ourselves, but I think we felt it was too big a thing just to, to do uh, in-house. But anyway, it all sort of came, started coming together until uh, about January, February time, and we decided to replace the whole floor. And this is where we suspected there would be problems, and boy, there were. Uh, we ended up with a whole uh, floor being excavated and it uh, becoming like a, I don't know, a, a screen set for the Battle of the Somme. Uh, it was an absolute and utter mess. Victorian drains that had collapsed, obviously donkeys years ago, which accounted for dampness and rot that had been a problem for the last 50 or 60 years. The, the wooden floor in the hall had been replaced at least three times in the last uh, 60 years in people's memory. And um, we felt it was time to try and do something uh, about it. So um, yeah, it was all dug out. Um, and when we went down about eight inches, a little bit further, about eight, eight inches further in order to put insulation in below the concrete that we were going to lay, and that's when we discovered the collapsed drains. Um, it's amazing how things work out. Um, the cost, it was an extra 30 to 40,000 pounds to deal with this. Um, and just at the same time, um, this bequest, uh, there was a residual amount that had been held by the solicitor. We thought it was about two or 3,000 pounds and the check came through for about 30,000 pounds, no. uh, which covered the costs and it was, you know, it, there was no discussion really. We knew we had to do it. Um, one of the difficulties being that we couldn't have church meetings to agree these things. So the trustees were taking decisions that we instinctively knew the congregation would deal with, but we were having to sort of find sort of retrospective agreement. Uh, and that hasn't been a problem because I think folks uh, trusted the trustees uh, with the work that was being done and with the decisions that were being taken. But after getting worse, it started to get better. Uh, things began to be built rather than uh, deconstructed. Um, and I'll just show you a, a sort of succession of pictures. Our kitchen begins to come together. Um, the new entranceway, we had gone from two, uh, there had originally been two aisles, but we it took all the pews out downstairs and we went from two side doors to a central doorway. The idea being that it's all glazed and you can now see right into the church and uh, it's a bit disconcerting because I've recorded a couple of services in the church uh, from the, the communion table and you stand there and you can see people now walking past on the street, which is actually uh, partly what we wanted to achieve, that sense of openness that no longer is it closed off. You look in the door and you see a, a big wall. Uh, so it all started coming together. Uh, the hall uh, has been totally transformed. And um, the scaffolding went up for painting the ceiling from a, a very dark uh, 1960s, 70s sort of green, which was a very austere, uh, sort of very dull uh, sort of, it must have looked good in its day, I suppose, but it looked pretty dreadful uh, these days. Um, we went for seaside colours, we're only about three or four hundred yards from the seaside, uh, and uh, it was interesting how the colours were chosen. Uh, apparently the architect says you start with what can't be changed and the dominant colours were uh, red, yellow and the blue which gave us some nice seaside colours, uh, sandy sandy coloured walls, uh, a sky sort of blue and then sort of blues down below uh, with a little bit of red uh, in for good measure. And as I say it all started to come together. Um, and this is where it then becomes really exciting because all of a sudden you see this um, mess, <laughs> this bomb site beginning to sort of emerge, it's something beginning to emerge from this bomb site that uh, begins to sort of resemble what it is you envisaged it might be. And we're now at the stage where um, the, the end is very much uh, in sight. Uh, the first one there is our new entrance. Uh, this is looking in from the front door and you can see right through uh, into the church. Um, the vestibule has been tidied up uh, considerably. Uh, we now have level access right through the ground floor of the building. 
uh, we have a, a new area for the, the kids uh, to play, uh, which is in a sort of separate um, vestibule, inner sort of vestibule, but still very much part of the church, main church, as opposed to, we, we wanted to get away from this idea of sending the kids out of church. Uh, I've always been uneasy about that. And I think, uh, you, but you also have to be practical. They need a place to, to express themselves and to make a bit of noise and that without uh, sort of uh, annoying their mothers or uh, anybody else who's around. Uh, so th th that's been, a, it looks a lovely space. Um, this is us set out now for our socially distanced worship. Uh, I think our two meters might come down to one meter by the time we open. So it'll probably be a little bit fuller than that. Um, new uh, accessible toilet uh, just at the door. That was the thing that really sold it to a lot of our older members uh, who were wondering, oh, do we need to do all of this? And when they had thoughts of a toilet near the door that they could just slip and use rather than <laughs> any time they used the toilet, they had to trot through the church. Um, we all know where you're going, but um, that, that's uh, been a real uh, sort of plus. Um, another view from the, the pulpit. Um, that's our hall, which uh, still has a little bit of work to be done. Uh, there's some drying out to take place uh, on the floor. Um, our new um, loos and baby change facilities and all the rest of it. Uh, new kitchen, uh, which is a delight to everybody. Um, and this was then just one final picture. And that's uh, the, the, the sort of the change that is taking place. And it's quite a, a transformation. Um, I always feel that pews can be a real barrier and add to, there's lots of barriers in churches. And uh, I think from a perspective of leading worship, it was the removing of as many of those barriers as we possibly could. Um, eventually my intention would be that the communion table uh, will actually be down on the floor, almost sort of restoring that sense of, you know, our sort of reformed and congregational sort of heritage, which is that this is the family table. It's not some sort of distant altar set apart from people it's got to be there amongst folks and we gathered around the table and um, it's set up there on the platform for just now uh, but eventually it'll come down and um, it gives us a flexible space where we can begin to uh, assemble ourselves much more imaginatively than, than, than before uh, and uh, I suppose we're just at this stage now just looking forward to getting back in and beginning to, to sort of reform ourselves as a, as a gathered uh, community for, for worship which we've missed for so long now, um, but that's us. And uh, it's been a, a bit of a, a rocky journey at times, but it's been a, it's been a good one. Uh, and uh, folks think are, are very excited, uh, certainly by the pictures that they've seen, and are just looking forward now to getting back in and getting back down to business. So okay. has, has some of the congregation not seen it yet then, or been in it yet, Ke uh, Kevin? <laughs> We've had folks in um, in Scotland where we are permitted to have uh, business meetings for the purpose of uh, preparing to, to reopen the building. Uh, yeah. So we had a, a deacons, we've had a couple of deacons meetings uh, and the first deacons meeting, which it wasn't quite at this stage, people were absolutely blown away by yeah. it. I think just the, the, the contrast of what had been there uh, previously um, and just the sense of light and openness, the way it's been painted. Uh, you know, the colours, you know, the, the, everything just seems to have been absolutely transformed. Um, yeah. Everything's lighter and brighter. And as I say, the barriers have gone. And I think that's been, been the thing. And I, I think ultimately we, we wanted a space that, that could be flexible and could be used. Um, you know, and, and when we've had inquiries already uh, about uh, booking halls and things like that, which we're not quite at the stage of doing, obviously, but uh, you know, towards the end of the summer. Uh, I think we're hopeful that this will be a, a, a place that will be well used. Uh, by fantastic. Different. I think the colours look amazing. The red. Beautiful, are beautiful, isn't it? Gorgeous. Fantastic. Um, and what joy that will be when you welcome everybody in those oh, yes. mornings. How yeah. exciting is that for you? God bless you. That Thank you so much for sharing your story. I hope that's an encouragement to everyone this morning. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask you a question, Kevin? Before you we okay, Yvonne? Yeah, of course. I, I just, I, I, mean, I think this looks, it looks wonderful, Kevin. I mean, it's a great story. I, I just wanted to ask quickly, you've obviously done things very deliberately. You know, you, you really have planned, you know, what do you think is going to be of best use to the Lord and to your congregation, you know, as you move forward. So I'm just wondering, you, you must have decided to keep the upper, you know, you've still got a balcony, as it were, you know, um, and that, that's like pews, you know. Is the organ still a functioning pipe organ? 
I mean, and I, I'm, those were my two questions about, you know, you, you decided to keep them. Yeah. In terms of the, the, the upstairs, we, we had looked at that and there were plans developed for altering the upstairs too, uh, to make it more level floors and perhaps extra rooms in that. We felt that that was just beyond our means at this point in time. Right. Uh, it would have required the installation of a lift. But what we have done is we've quite deliberately left the corner, which is the kids area at the moment. That's where a lift would be installed. So. In a, in a sense, we've looked ahead to the future that if things do develop <clears> and we needed that extra space upstairs, then we've got that, you know, the lift could be put in and that work could be done. But we decided to, to leave the upstairs as was for mm. the time being. Okay. Um, it's, it's different levels. The, the, the pews sort of sit on different levels. It's sort of, it's tiered. Yeah. Uh, so it would yeah. take quite a bit of work. Um, the organ pipes are purely decorative. Uh, the organ uh, was... The, the pipe organ was taken out, I think, in the late 70s uh, and replaced with an electronic organ. So in behind those pipes are big, massive speakers. So it's an electronic organ, uh, but it, it, it's, a very, it's a very good organ and um, you know, very, very good sound. But the pipes were left at that time uh, because that, I suppose it was a feature uh, and they decided just to, to keep them there. No, yeah. thank you. And, and were the stained glass windows, are those original from the, the church that was or are they new? Yeah, no, they, they were put in in the 1870s, uh, so they're, they're pretty, pretty old, yeah. Thank you, Kevin, thank you. Oh, God bless you, Kevin, thank you so much for sharing. And um, I'll, uh, I'll just pray those smiles as people come through that door and see that really make your heart leap as you, um, as all the sleepless nights you've had over the past few years. Oh, haven't had many. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Okay, so that's one transformation that I hope has inspired you. We have another one this time from Wales, from Bonavent, and Sue is going to share with us. Kevin, can you take your um, sharing yep. for me, please? And then we can share her presentation too. You okay, Sue? So. Yeah, I'm on my way. It's all right, take your time, it's fine. Sorry, it's my, my computer decided to play up now, so I won't Oh, no, no, no. No, it hasn't, it hasn't decided to play up. It's fine. <laughs> I was just gonna I was just gonna say while Sue's um sorting out her computer that our church we've put our altar on wheels. Um just for that flexibility. We can wheel it around on the floor now. Um and it's used like for your communion as well and it's used for signing registry when you get married and um, we can wheel it and shove it in the corner when we don't need it and that's quite useful can you see my Hello. community table on wheels hello yeah you are right no we can't yeah. see the screen yet can't. Uh, okay if you go click on to share screen at the bottom and then you should get a box up with all different little boxes and then just click the one that you that you want and then Amazing. go there you go you've yeah, done it brilliant well done yeah. him. so um so yes yeah, so I, I i took a little bit of a different track here so um bear with me so this is um the, the, the front of our chapel small chapel in um blind Avon, and um in april 2009 it closed as the membership dwindled um, and I want it was it was the biggest congregation they've seen for a long time, and everyone said, "Oh dear, and such a shame." I wonder what will happen. We were the church on the main street. The Sunday school um, room um, ceiling had fallen in. We've got overgrown cemetery, decaying interior. You know the story. So many chapels have been through it. And then who was going to save it? And was it just going to fall down? And because of its position, lots of people wanted to use it and turn it into a community centre. But um, was that the right path for it? And where was God in, in, in all of this? Um, and here's just a couple of pictures, you know, pretty typical, lots of chapels look a bit, you know, I'm sure all of us have got a corner that looks like that. We don't now, but I'm sure people have. And, you know, nothing, nothing special, except it being a house of God in our chapel. Um, we did have a wedding, as you can see, a blessing of a wedding. And we did our very best. Um, 
They all looked a bit hopeless and a bit grim, cold in need of updating, uh, but in the stillness and the decay, you knew God was there all the time. He knew he was there. But he had a secret weapon, and that was Jill Stevens, and you've all met Jill. Jill and her husband, George, had spent a lot of time at Bethlehem. He spoke with Mark and the Congregational Federation, and his support we cherish to this day, and she pounded the streets of Glen Avon. Quite frankly, I managed a day nursery. She knocked on my door one day and said, um, I need 16 children to attend Messy Church. And, and I opened the door and said, Stacey, have you got 16 children need to send to Messy Church tomorrow? There's food involved. And she said, yes. And Jill's take on the story was that she had booked Messy Church. And when she came out, no one had um, booked to go. And when she came out, a voice in her head said, go to Busy Bees. And she said, but I don't want little children. And then being known to her, we're running a holiday club. So 16 of our children enjoyed Messy Church at Easter time with Jill. Um, and she literally pounded the streets, visited everybody. She held awareness sessions, fundraising events. She had a lovely choir from Cornwall. She applied for some small grants. Um, and this is the Church Support Workers of the Federation. And once again, in 2011, it became a congregational church. And then in 2014, we had a grant that enabled the, the employment of a church support worker, which is a great leap of faith because there wasn't a very big church at that point in time. And together they secured enough grant money to repair the Sunday school room. I unfortunately don't have pictures of that at the moment. So there's a picture of Jill. Can you see her up in the pulpit? That's on our rededication service. Um, and what we did was at every possible town meeting or town event, so we were there. Bethlehem was there in one form or another. We weren't sure people were there. We were there. Even though the building was looking so dilapidated, we made sure it was basically safe and we opened it whenever it was possible. It was open. I did go meetings and coffees and cakes and stuff there. And um, we did Christian Aid coffee mornings. Um, if somebody was in there, if Anthony was there, he just opened the doors and people would come in for coffee. We worked with churches working together. We had the annual Good Friday service. And we looked at the talents of the church members. We had our Sunday school room. So we opened a pottery club, a brick club and a lunch club. Um, and the Potter Group was recognised with a Faith in Action Award. We had um, a dementia cafe and the brownies moved in. We could just about, uh, if, if it didn't mind being cold, we were okay. And we had Cafe Church and Messy Church. Um, lots of you have already gone through this kind of thing. What do you need to do? What do you like to go? General upgrade, whole new look, you know, that's all. Um, and this was our vision, a place we could hold services again, a place of prayer, a place that people want to come to, a place that would work for us a church to enable us to carry on with our outreach, work within the community, made everyone feel welcome, responded to the needs of our community, and where we could make disciples um, just the same vision as everyone else had. Here's one of our Good Friday services on the square. That was the Covenant Players, and that's people from all the churches in Glen Avenue attending. And here's our pottery class. And you can see it's not a very big school room at all. And it's smaller now because part of it's been um, taken to make a corridor into the chapel. And we did fair shares um, on a Thursday. We continued to do that. So we ran out of space. And meanwhile, the chapel continued to decay. We had to carry out emergency floor repairs and covered the broken windows with pure specs. And we fitted a temporary heating system. So there we go. That's the state the windows were in. But we were able to remove the pews. A gentleman from Cadu said, um, they're nothing special. So out they came and we managed to get some chairs. Um, so what next? A church with a small membership, big dreams, a rundown building and a lot of faith. And Jill's continued vision that we could once be able to proclaim God's glory. And there was a lot of prayer, lots and lots of prayer. And we even hosted another church. At one point, the local um, um, charismatic church needed a home. And we said, oh, you know, if you don't mind being cold and it looking a bit gloomy, you can use our building. And they did. But then prayers were answered because our community engagement had paid off. And because we were at the heart of the town, we were chosen for a facelift and the potential to be match funding for another grant. And we were able to apply for the grants because we had that good community engagement and um, maybe the grant aid we wouldn't normally fit the criteria form and Bethlehem's a great two listed building so Kevin you share your pain there so there were lots of things 
So for example, we couldn't have ordinary plaster back in the church. It is lime, it is lime plaster. Um, we, um, there were lots of things we couldn't do. We had to have a perfectly good roof. We did have a good roof removed to have another one put on. So some of the things seemed quite senseless, but they all had to fit, fall within CADU, um, CADU's recommendation. Um, but we have God and his secret weapons and how he works to other people. So he sent people to us who could help us fill out grant forms um, and find match funding. And the amazing project manager came along with um, Stephen, who was from CADU, and he really guided us through the process really well. So we wouldn't have done this without a really good project manager. And we were also incredibly fortunate, or God was working through everybody, because there was funding within the grants for a project manager. He advertised for the tenders, interviewed and appointed the contractors because it was restoring a historic building. He kept us informed and the builders on their toes. And the deadline mm -hmm. for handing the uh, for the handing the service came back and went. Sorry, it should have been um, the building came and went, but eventually, and it was about six months, I think, because there were there were things with the schoolroom that happened. It started to fall down, so we felt that perhaps we better build it again. Um, but we had a building that was watertight, had new heating, new plumbing, toilet, safe floors, an audio visual system, and it still retained the sense of God being present. So again, um, um, Kevin and everybody else has already covered this. We had a couple of members of the church who liaised with Kim. So that was Jill and Granville and Anthony at the time. And where practicable, they had the decision. If there was an emergency, they had the decision-making powers. Um, because we're a small church, actually, we also had um, a Facebook Messenger page. So really, a, a thing could come up on there and, and people could put there. But but literally, and when I say a small church, I'm talking about I'm talking 10 members. So that's how small we are. And we stayed as much as we could on top of the budget. We did get caught out because we didn't fully understand that, that stuff would be retained from the grants and that grants didn't cover everything that we put into the plan. Um, so that's an issue that we're still working through as a church. You know, we're waiting for this grant retention to come back to finish paying this. And that is a bit of a headache for us. So it is something that um, at the time we weren't totally aware of. And we held regular prayer meetings to help guide us through it. So here we go. We're in pieces here. There's a hole in my floor. Um, <laughs> the cross, wow. I know. The cross is presiding over it all there. And, um, and we'd already done some emergency repair. So, you know, this goes to show just how bad it was. Um, being an old chapel, it didn't have, um, people had blocked up the vents that went in under the floor and, and therefore the air didn't flow. Here we go, just to prove that it's not as big as your hole in the ground, Kevin, but it was quite significant for us. <laughs> um, and again, we have a, a, central, um, a central door. And we've still got our two little side doors because Cadden were very insistent that the building told the, told its story. So although the pews could be removed um, and the, um, the doorway taken out, the glass from the window is actually used in the new doorway. So just some alarming pictures. Um, again, people have already said this, use what we've had. We couldn't use any more, we couldn't use the Sunday school room any more than we were doing it. And the desk carries a long way. So if you've got stuff you need to um store we we um we purchased a shed and it all went out there um storage again is something that we have an issue with because we're not allowed to attach anything extra to the walls so that's going to be an issue for us going forward um we used our social media and lots of publicity so that everyone um got on board with it um our local um tva Torvang voluntary um organization are really good at um, helping us with sourcing grants um i suppose everyone needs to be to be aware of any conditions of the grants and then to accept help to this day we've got a small band of volunteers who come to help with fair share who love the building and the grounds but are not interested in any of that religious stuff we'll get them in the end but we've got to do it in our in their time so i've uh, written above our um pulpit in Welsh and I can't pronounce it so I haven't written it is and the gate to heaven is here and it's from um the story of Jacob's ladder we had a rededication service when we were able to open and the whole town celebrated with us um Dr um Richard Cleves um was there 
and here we go what a transformation so many people um, and you can see there again we went for um we had certain colors that we could use certain paints that we can use the upstairs pew underneath one of them is lined with things of paint that we could only repaint things with this um decision making on paint colors took oh 15 minutes and a slice of cake and a cup of coffee in a church meeting it was amazing <laughs> Um, this is you down now. We're still carrying out fair shares. We hosted Nib Nibley Church for breakfast, and that, and you can see how much um, how much um, lovelier it all looks. And this was found under the plasterboard that somebody thought ought to go up in the 1960s. Stunning church ceiling, um, just so simple yet so beautiful. I love it. And the pew numbers that tell the story as Gladio asked us to do. Um, since then, so this is 2019, we had a rock conversation and out of there came the chance to begin a befriending service, but um, we got the grant for that. We had to pay it back this year because COVID-19 got in the way of developing that. We secured a grant to purchase tablets and we're waiting to work in partnership with a local housing association to start a silver super star group. We continue to hold services first on the phone and then in person and Wales um, went into lockdown along with everybody else right before our Christmas service and we weren't standing for that but there was nothing in the regulations to say that we couldn't have face-to-face -face services only that you had to really risk assess them so we carried on and we carried on um, all the way through um, and then in partnership with a local nursery um, we've just opened a parent and toddler group we, we, we booked the spaces it's called but it's called bumble tops and i tell you what the relief on those mums faces when they come in because at last they can meet other other, other mums and the children um it's been it's been really good and that's that's us at bethlehem oh thank you so much so it is such an inspiration because i know when i visited a couple of times you were using that small little school room yeah. now to think that you've got the whole of the sanctuary building as well and the sanctuary space to use as well must be like well it's uh it's life-changing isn't it in that sense although people are still drawing to the church to use yeah. the space and um, yeah and and for those of you that are you know were, were interested in how you how you attract people into the building how do you get how you um use better how you use the space better so that people can come in i think we've had some some things kind of trickling out of here and i'll put something together that's a little bit more detailed but it is about storage and um, is about accessibility at the moment is also about risk assessments um and um also contracts as well i've been doing some work this week with the church about making sure that there's good guidelines in place um you know so that you know exactly what's happening within your building mm. and um, you've got a firm contract in place with whoever wants to yeah and and i think as well that if there's one thing as a church we're not very good at it's perhaps being a little bit business minded and Absolutely. making sure that what we are asking people to to give because basically that's what you know we are we are charging them um m most of them um because we we need a the money to keep the building but b we need the money because we want to provide other services mm. that may not have a cost mm. to it to, mm. to that particular clientele yeah. or that client group and i and i know that as, as a church as far as that goes we said oh people think that we should be charging less because we are a church and i think it can be a dangerous situation to fall into i don't deal with money because if if Grenville says we've got fifty pounds to spend, I bring in receipts for two hundred and fifty. I'm rubbish on it. You know? <laughs> I've never been given money. It's not my forte. Prayer I can do, and um, <laughs> do with people I can do, but don't ask me to. And as soon as an Excel spreadsheet comes along, well, my my screen saver goes up. Bless you. So but, but I, but I, I think... with somebody who loves them. So yeah, yeah, I think that's. Uh... But I think that is definitely true. This there's, there's uh, with with churches that that's the issue that I've dealt with this week that it's been too casual so of course then when it gets formal it all gets a bit more stressful and upsetting and falling out and um, so if we're if we're kind of straight and business-like from the beginning we haven't got any of those to deal with going along the lines thank you both so much Sue and Kevin um such inspiring stories and transformations and we pray blessings over you both as you continue uh, in your new in your new spaces 
Uh, any questions anybody's got? Because I'm just conscious of time now, it's 10 to 12. Sally. Just um, a comment really. So firstly, thank you so much for sharing those stories. Really inspirational and exciting. Um, Saffron touched on it. We talked a little bit about it last time and Sue and Kevin also did the importance of relationships and community engagement. And um, I'm a trustee of the Graham Madden Centre, which is community centre in South and linked to the church. And so we're always applying for grants for repairing the roof mainly, but also for setting up new projects and how to use the space. And increasingly, grant givers are requiring evidence that, you, that we've kind of actually gone out into the community and what we think we want, whether it's a new toddler group or a new workspace or co-working space is actually what the community wants. And the important, I'm a, I'm a market researcher anyway, so I, I love all of that. But even if it, you're just wanting to start something new, if you can do some kind of community audit, even at a basic level of what things are going on in your town on certain days, or do more direct uh, engagement in terms of surveys and or bringing people together and asking, I think it's really useful, not only for the church to know what there is out there that maybe you didn't know about before, where there are gaps in, like what's being provided, but also, yeah, just when you're applying for grants, it's more and more useful to have some kind of hard evidence that this is actually something that is lacking in our community. Um, so yeah, just a comment on that. Really. Brilliant. And actually that could be a great action um, for, um, for you, Sue, and for Sandra and um, Gillian going forward, actually, couldn't it? Yeah. Definitely, yes. Yeah, fair. I agree with that um, because there's no point in put, trying to do something that's already being done in the town. Mm. You need to be finding something different that the town and the community feel they need. So thanks for that. And there'll, be, there'll be a lot of people coming out of um, COVID isolation. And so COVID-19 recovery is going to be, it's, it, it, it's big throughout, isn't it? So I think yeah. there's a lot of opportunity as churches to find out what the community feels it need it, it, it needs and you know maybe and be able to provide that space to do that absolutely julia um just very quickly the thing i was going to say um at the end of before where um saffron said to go and have pre-planning applications when we were doing our job up in Northumberland, the one thing that um, one of the councils said is very few people contact the county, the council's environmental planner, and they are there for advice as well. If you, if you, especially if you're listed buildings, what may and may not be able to be done for um, in within the grounds, things like that. Um, anything you do that is making um, that is directly related to facilities for the disabled is VAT free, so that saves you, even if it was only our toilet space, none of that attracted any VAT. And please, please, please allow for overages because they will always happen. Also, small contractors are very unhappy about signing contract dates for all the reasons that were said. We were told if you put those in, you will reduce the number of people that will even want to tender because slippage nearly always happens and they can't afford those sort of liabilities. Yeah, I think you guys just trust God's timing as well, haven't you, Sonia, if you, if you think yeah. if it runs yeah. over, yeah. <laughs> Kevin, can I, can you say something? Can I just say, it's something, it's about the VAT. I mean, certainly for you know, accessible facilities and that, yes, they're VAT free. The other thing that we're in the process of claiming now is uh, the listed places of worship scheme, uh, which allows you to claim back your, your VAT. We're estimating that there are a number of things that aren't, aren't eligible, but most of what we have done is eligible. And we're estimating that we'll probably receive back between 30 and 40,000 uh, pounds in VAT um, or the equivalent of that from our VAT. So that, that's a major uh, sort of source of funding as well that folks need yeah. to be on top of very accessible i think it's slightly different in each of the the, the, the four nations. Uh, sort of nations but yeah. it's a it's a uk-wide scheme um, okay. so just do a search for uh, listed places of worship scheme um, thank you for yeah. i'll add those i'll add those few bits to my presentation so that you've got that thanks kevin sonia sorry 
Yeah, I was just going to say that with our planning application, we've got quite a few letters from the community saying that they use our vestry and they're looking forward to um, having a coffee shop there. Would that proof be needed as well when we go looking for grants or just with the planners? I think it depends where you're getting your grants from, Sonia, but there's a lot of grant bodies, especially I was just looking for the, for, for the nursery on um, awards for Wales and they're very much on what, what does your community think that, that they need as opposed to, you know, we need a, a new roof or we like a, co a coffee shop. I mean, I suppose really it's how you persuade your community to, 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 to back your project really. So your mm. letters would be, would be useful. And I suppose if you're on the outskirts of the Gower and you could do a bit of takeaway as well, people driving past, pulling and grab a coffee to go, perhaps you could do a little bit of um, roadside um, thingy because that's supporting the tourism industry and stuff like that there, isn't it? Well, yeah. yes, because we're on the main route sort of out of Swansea onto the Gower, we get quite a lot of cyclists coming past. So yeah. we know if we put sort of cycle racks and things and we can attract the cyclists then so yeah that'll be that, huge we'll be, yeah. we'll be queuing up on you on our way to Nicholson house we'll all be calling in that's right you. yes you can come in when it's done yes <laughs> if, if on, on that that very point there about being on a, a cycle route as it were I've forgotten the church what is the church down in the southwest uh, of England area that's done that remember they discovered this was a small church again in terms of membership yeah. And they just they, they sort of realised one day they were on a a very well used sort of cycle route, and they they've opened up a, a kind of a you know like a you know a refreshments kind of a ministry stop. Um, you know what you remember what I'm talking about? I could I could easily find out. I just can't remember sitting here. I can't remember. I can't remember from the southwest. I know that um, the northwest in Noel Green they did it for the bikers because there was a lot of people oh, yes. that were yes. going past, and they started biking yes. breakfast. I can't recall the cyclist, sorry, Walter. Because I'm just thinking, Sonia, it might be, you know, it would put you in touch with this church because yeah. they started yes, from yes, scratch. It, would be good, it wasn't yeah. Corf Castle, but it was it, and it wasn't, be, anyway, I'll find out, but there was a church that have done exactly that. Yeah, so it's good. And the other thing as well, for people who are working, there isn't anywhere in our locality for parcels to be dropped off. So we thought that that would be something else mm. that we would be able to offer the community as well. What a so, great idea. That's yeah. very, very good with internet deliveries now. Yes. Yeah, really. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for being part of this morning. I hope it's given you all food for thought. Um, and maybe as, as we finish and we, we'll just pray together that, you know, God uses this morning just to inspire you in a small way. Maybe it's just even looking at Eco Church a little bit more, looking at storage space, looking at some grants on how you... And how you share with your community, communicate with your community and find out your community needs going forward. Um, so thank you everyone for, for being part. Thank you so much for Saffron for your presentation, Sally for your expertise and for Kevin and Sue for sharing your stories. Um, we'll just pray before we go and uh, I'll keep you, I'll send you all the um, presentations and also just to thank CWM because CWM have funded these if only presentations our next ones are going to be about spirituality and then we're also looking as well at how we make better use of them on our website to, sh to share what we're doing too so Lord Jesus we just thank you for this time this morning just to think about where we are and the locality in which you've placed us and mm -hmm. pray into the verse from Jeremiah Jeremiah 29 verse 7 that says, um, we pray for peace and prosperity for where you have called us mm -hmm. and that you promise that when we pray for that, it will happen and we will prosper too. So Lord, we just pray for the buildings and the areas and the towns that we are and we pray peace and prosperity over them. And we, we thank you for that promise that you give us. Share mm -hmm. your vision, Lord, and bless us as we go on the rest of our day today. Thank you for Saffron and Sally and for the expertise and we pray blessings over them. Thank you for the work of Glenavon and of, here we go, 
Cacaldi, no, Cacaldi. <laughs> and we just pray again, continued blessing over them that um, all of those sleepless nights and all of that hard work just comes into fruition for you. And we bring, give you the glory, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. I can't, I can't say in the same life, can I? Cacaldi, yes, I can. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, does anything follow up um because of cwm that's what i was i was i should have carried on with saying before and we have got some money available because we've not done face to face because we've not had refreshments to be able to offer you we're kind of putting it back in a grant so if there is some storage that you need or there is some help with um grants that we can give you for your projects for planning whatever it is you need um, I will send the application form to you. Please fill yeah. it out and send it back to us and, and Walter and I will um, will move along with that. So God bless you. Have a nice rest of the day. It's actually still raining, I think. <laughs> it's, still <laughs> here. Oh, it's still raining. Thank you, everyone. Oh. God bless everybody. God bless. Bye. Bye. Thank you. 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 Th